You know, you don't, I think even the most uh, hard-nosed free speech person stops at people dying. You can't counsel murder, and so that's very problematic, the, uh, the release of those names. I'm not sure I'm completely with uh, Lorraine in the sense that, you know, she just seems to say that if something, it, it, there's, good, there's good national security effects from uh, lots of open transmission of uh, information. But the guy, Manning was a private. I mean, what, what kind of a system allows an American private to download all this information? I mean, maybe the Americans actually do need a little bit more controls. I know after 9-11 they moved to open, but there's open and then there's letting some private walk into a room and download every, every sort of informant you've got on the books. And it seems to me that's ridiculous. So, I mean, we need the pendulum to swing back a bit. And if nothing else, I assume that, I mean, if, if, if Manning can do this for a song, then who knows what kind of stuff's been released to the Chinese or the Russians. It, it seems like they've gone complete. It's just, it, it's beyond belief when you read this how easy it was to get it. So I'm not sure I agree that it's, uh, it's a real tragedy in the long run that uh, you know, the Americans might tighten up a bit and uh, you know, some two-bit little private can't, can no longer walk into a room and download every important information they have. But other than that, I, I'm largely in Lorraine's camp, I think. Lorraine, did you have any... Well, I think I'm in your camp on that because I certainly don't think it's a good idea that you can have some private walk in and download a heap of information. I just think from a freedom of speech perspective, I think there's a big difference between what Bradley Manning did, which I don't think is a matter of freedom of speech, versus what WikiLeaks has done, where I think there are freedom of speech issues in terms of allowing news organisations to publish leaked material. In the case of WikiLeaks, I don't think they've exercised nearly enough discretion or responsibility in terms of their provision of that material. And that's the point that I think really was trying to be made in the paper. I think we all agree that Channel 10 Special will be fair, unbalanced, and perfectly neutral on every aspect of the uh, thing. <laughs> can, can I uh, add uh, a point? Because I was uh, also thinking when you were uh, a lot, my wheels were turning, uh, talking about national security, there were actually uh, two uh, very core cases uh, as far as national security is concerned and free speech. One is the Pentagon Papers yep. case, uh, which of course in the Anglo-Saxon world is very much well, uh, very well known. And another one that was quite similar that was decided by the German Constitutional Court, um, and it's called the Spiegel case. Spiegel is the leading big uh, news magazine in Germany. And uh, they had published in the 60s, uh, in 1962, a title story that said, uh, um, li uh, limited readiness. And it uh, went to the state of the West German armed forces, you know, their height of the Cold War, uh, Cuba crisis, everything, you know, the tensions boiling. And they published based on secret, highly secret uh, documents that had been leaked, um, uh, uh, an assessment of the capabilities of the West German military, which was not good. Um, and of course, um, there was, you know, yeah, Cold War, you know, national security, trees, and all, all of these things. Uh, Pentagon paper similarly, mm -hmm. and um, there you you can create the problem with the, uh, the the WikiLeaks is you can it's easier to say to WikiLeaks yes that is you know irresponsible and to put the names forward and and, and, and to create that type of damage, um, but you can theoretically create and that is of course all those who believe in state secrets would would say you can create similar if not worse damage by you know publishing these types of pentagon papers or whatever it is and to to find the balance between we need to have that debate and therefore we need to have the information um, and responsibility is really is really a fine line okay yes the discussion about Assange's proceeding citizens' rights to know and state interest and security. There is another means through which this issue arises, and that is property rights that people have in information. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if your doctor was to go out and publish your medical records, she would be breaching a very serious rule. There would, in fact, be criminal consequences for it, but there would also be civil consequences. Equity, obviously, direct itself to confidence first amongst other things. This was attempted to be resolved in the spy catch case when rights were to publish his uh, biography in Australia. Uh, is there a tension between um, private interests in information, property rights, if you like, and freedom of speech, or is, there, is it an illusion? And if there is a conflict, how is that best resolved? I would say absolutely. I mean, if you look at the, the documents that WikiLeaks are now releasing, it's the spy files, which is a tranche of um, security and intelligence information taken from a private company 
in America that actually makes its money by selling that information um, to other people. So certainly there are clear private interests that have been affected in or over and above the national security interests that are also there. And the state presumably also has property interests as well. It has <coughs> agency obligations, it has official you know, secrets, but it also has contractual relations with mm -hmm. its agents who covenant not to release secrets. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if any of the other speakers have used that. Uh, well, I, I, if, if, if I can add to it, it really is the it really is the same principal question, only in a different guise. Whether you, uh, if it comes to a court uh, uh, dispute over that, whether you say, well, there's some kind of state interest in, in national security that prevents the publication, or whether you're going to say we are having we are extending our private law regime. Uh, to the ownership of such uh, uh, information and then say, well, because it wasn't yours, it belonged to the state or it belonged to a private person, and therefore you can't publish it, comes out to the same question, do you have, is, should there be a right for, for you to be able to publish that or to, to read that or to have access to it or not? And it's only a different uh, line of argument. Um, I suppose it doesn't fall foul of Mr. James's uh, Alice Millsian point, which is about the exchange of arguments arguments don't have this quality of ownership, whereas information does. I, I took your first question to be rhetorical. You already knew the answer. And uh, so on the property rights thing, well, obviously, intellectual property limits stuff without payment. And I used to be, well, I still think that we over we overprotect on IP, and we, we need some IP. I think we overprotect, although I've moderated a bit since I've started getting checks in the mail for stuff I was going to write anyway. And I, <laughs> I keep getting this money, and I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. But it, it really does, it's indefensible, but attractive. You know what I mean? Can I just make a yes. Uh, you used the phrase, the level of acceptance uh, of, of um, the, the level of acceptance of the general principles and, uh, uh, laid out in the, in the European Convention. And, and translating that into the domestic sphere, that um, the level of acceptance of legislation, for example, the racial vilification or the, the religious vilification legislation in Victoria. Um, I'm reminded of a comment that uh, Mark Stein made at a, at a seminar here in Perth a few months ago. He spoke, and it was, he was actually speaking in the immediate uh, aftermath of the release of the Finkelstein uh, report, uh, and he was he was um, speculating on uh, what would be the effect of the controls that um, that um, uh, Finkelstein was recommending on people like Andrew Bolt, for example, mm. who just recently been prosecuted under mm. under I think it was the racial modification legislation. Victoria and, and Mark Stain made the very obvious point. Well, you know, if, if 10,000 Victorians all wrote into Andrew Bolt's blog and said, "Yes, Andrew, we agree with you," the state would be powerless to prosecute 10,000 individuals. Mm -hmm. So the level of acceptance that uh, Professor Brimham was talking about—that I mean, it may sound heretical within a room of lawyers, but isn't really the remedy. It's a self-help. It's a citizen self-help remedy. Civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. If we all if we all sign up to Andrew Bolt's opinions, the the, the state is powerless really to inf to enforce its will. Mm -hmm. Well, I just say two things. Firstly, for, uh, Jurgen, when he mentioned the, you know David Cameron going apoplectic about the prisoner voting, what he didn't say was that the top British judges have gone apoplectic about the European Convention too. When you get someone like Lord Hoffman letting rip about how. The European courts have no grasp of common law and they're completely out to lunch. And Jonathan Sumption doing the same thing. It's not just the British politicians. There's a sense in Britain that the entire European Convention is, is you know, just hammering the common law because these civilians have no clue about, at all about how it works. Now, you know, I never agree with and Lord Hoffman. And they don't. I have, you know, I never agree with Lord Hoffman. But on this one, you know, he had something to say on the Bolt case. Look, um, I think the legislation is appalling. But... But um, the judge, Bromberg, was it Bromberg? Where is Chris? Yes, Bromberg. Bromberg. You know, it's a terrible judgment. Okay, so look, everyone says, oh, he could have got, they could have gone after him for defamation. Bromberg takes Section 18D, the defense, and he says you have to view it through the eyes of a reasonable member of the victim community. So in other words, <laughs> you put yourself in the shoes of someone who wants to be a victim, and you say, what would a reasonable victim feel? Now look, in defamation law, it's the reasonable person. And on the reasonable person test, which would have been used in defamation, 
people would have won. Um, I don't, you know, you can understand why they didn't appeal. You know, the the the, the insurers of the newspaper, they, they put out about a million dollars, Bolt told me. So it's about, you know, they're at about a million bucks. And what did it actually cost the insurers? Nothing. They have to put an apology up. It didn't cost them any money. So if you're an insurer, why would you pay to run an appeal that's going to cost you another $150,000, $400,000? Why are you going to appeal when the cost is, well, Bolt's article gets taken down and they have to run this sort of pseudo pathetic apology that nobody really believes. It's like Orwellian. Um, so there's no way they were ever going to appeal. So the Bolt case is problematic because it was a bad judgment, I think. The legislation is terrible too, but the judgment made it worse. Mm -hmm. And I don't actually agree with you. That I don't know that if a thousand people wrote in, the government would just pick who they're going to prosecute. Mm -hmm. I think, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Can I just make a... Oh. No, just raise an issue. Like, uh, I think, for instance, the if you think about the vilification law, the religious vilification law, I think that what happened is that um, Andrew Bolt is uh, so basically he was uh, uh, charged of um, racial discrimination or something of this sort, but not derived from the vilification law in Victoria, it's from a federal act. But I, I believe that we are, we are facing a problem, and uh, Professor Bremer was, uh, was talking about this idea of um, how we, we draft a Bill of Rights. I mean, we, we have this problem with uh, group rights and, uh, versus individual rights. I mean, I think what some people now claim to be rights, uh, um, I think they can be quite controversial in a certain sense because it's this idea that um, you sh should protect the group rather than the, the individual. And sometimes you have the individual being, uh, re the rights of the individual in this, case, in this situation being actually removed from the individual. I, I think I'll give an example like I could think about, I'm not going to give examples, but uh, perhaps uh, I could say that there are instances of the, the use of Bill of Rights that have been quite bad in terms of removing individual rights. I can't think about, for instance, the Dred Scott the Tred Scott case in America that was uh, an instance of judicial activism based on the American Bill of Rights. I actually think that sometimes you can actually use the Bill of Rights to undermine the basic rights of the individual. I think it's very dangerous when you draft this kind of document that you make clear that the rights of the individual are going to be preserved, especially in this culture of, of, of entitlements and that the groups, they feel that they, have, they should have more rights than others. And uh, every time you give rights to, to a group, there's quite a possibility that the rights of the others who are not members of this group are going to be affected and removed. Because, of course, every time you empower someone, you disempower others. I mean, so you have to be very careful about this uh, kind of approach. And another thing is the methods of interpretation available. Like, even if you, if you draft a very good Bill of Rights, I feel that this is still a bit dangerous in terms of the approaches that the, the courts can, can take. For instance, uh, they can apply a, a living instrument document in which actually the, the, they can discover new rights and they can undermine the other existing ones. I think so. Even, even if, you, if you draft these, you have to be careful because the judges can actually distort of, uh, the original meaning of the, of the document. So all these kind of things, they actually have to be taken into account. I believe that everybody, Professor Bremer and uh, Alan, and everybody here, is, here agrees with the, the necessity of protecting the basic rights of the individual. But I actually think that's a matter of how you do that that really makes us a bit different in terms of, your, of, of our um, uh, understanding. But um, I still believe that um, the creation of some new, new rights, they might actually be just special privileges that can be granted to people on the basis of, for instance, race or, or, or gender and things of this nature that can actually be quite dangerous in, if, you, if you think about a liberal democracy and every person counting as a, a normal individual citizen. I came from Brazil. I wouldn't be happy with the government imposing upon myself my Brazilianness, but I just want to be a normal citizen endowed with the rights that I don't think are actually given by the state. I am an old-fashioned guy. I believe that the rights are not given by the states. They are inalienable to the, to the individual, and, uh, and the states have only to recognize them. And among these rights, I still think the rights to life, liberty, and, and property are the most important. And they are not state-given. The states can only protect. Free speech, too. And free speech is a result of them, uh, the liberty of the individual to, to be free to speak whatever they want. 
provided that's not such a thing that will disrupt uh, certain elementary things related to nat natural security, security things like that. But everybody would agree with the idea that um, there are some limits to freedom of speech. I think the, pro the problem is that to whom you should give this final authority in terms of uh, if, whether this is coming from the courts or if it could be coming from the, the legislature. I think checks and balances is actually a very important thing too. So in a certain sense, I think that these things can actually be balanced because it's not um, a kind of democracy that you have that you can do whatever you wish. Like there are some limits in terms of the protection of rights and things of so forth and so forth. So I have these things have to be balanced. My simply that, that yeah. if the law doesn't have wide acceptance, 30, 40 years ago, citizens just had to take it on the chin. Now, with the miracle of the internet, mm -hmm. they can directly, directly <coughs> defy that law, or directly express their opposition. To that so, law. over 50% of people are against the carbon tax. What are they doing about that? The citizens, you know, uprising. You, there's no way that can be right. There's a whole whole bunch of things you cannot do. You have to work through the process of legislation. You can, you can what? Every you got 50% of Australians just refuse to pay their carbon tax, higher electricity bill. I think that the, the civil law tradition was um, based on this understanding of um, positive law and codification of law. But that, that came mainly through the Napoleonic era, in which Napoleon decided to create the civil codes and things of this nature. Originally, the idea was actually to be based on natural law th theory. But they thought that because natural law is something that's immutable, it was just a matter of sorting out the truth, and then the truth to be revealed in these codes. So I actually don't, don't believe that the, the civil law tra tradition is based on, on this disregard for the truth. I think it's actually that the legislator would be able to sort out the truth, and this would be so immutable and eternal that they can actually create these codes. And the, the codification of law was based originally on the idea of natural law and natural rights. But of course, the result of that is that if you have everything codified, then you don't need to discuss natural law theory any longer because everything you find in the code. So it, it led, ultimately, it led to the advent of legal positivism in the 19th century because then once you have the, all these codes, what, the philosophical discussion ceases to, to prevail. And then the judges have to do what Montesquieu, or Montesquieu, here people say Montesquieu, said about um, this idea that the judges are the mouth of the law and they basically repeat like parrots what the law says, and they would not have to uh, entertain themselves in, uh, with re relation to things such as reason and, and so forth, because the law would just dictate what they have to do. In the common law system, I also believe that it's also equally based on natural law theory and the discovery of the truth. But this would be done more gradually and perhaps more modestly. So according to the, the common law tradition, I think the idea of truth is actually very present, because I believe that that both had these ideas that we have uh, certain things that are objectively right and certain things that are obje objectively wrong. What this kind of legislation that we have now, the verification law creates, is like the idea that there is no objective truth. So everything is actually relative. That's why you don't have, you cannot have a robust discussion because this can actually be disruptive. So the government now is telling us that, look, these discussions about religion, first of all, Religious people, they might be very stupid to still believe in God and all these things. So it's better not to have them discussing this kind of issues because they're disturbing the peace, they're disturbing the order. That comes from a postmodern perspective that truth is relative. But it can be hijacked by absolutists like radical religionists who can actually say that, well, I know what the, what the truth is, and if everybody defies my understanding of the truth, then I can use the law as an instrument of persecution. So I believe that it is kind of an unholy alliance 
between the postmodernists and the religious extremists. We can actually use the legislation to persecute people who think different. What about my question on this? You were concerned about not being able to lie about truth and religious delegation. Mm -hmm. That's why I believe it is, um, it's invalid in terms of um, the constitutionality of this. Not that I believe that we should be so concerned about constitutional matters, because you raised the issue of the common law tradition. And I think this is actually even more important, in my opinion. But it's about this idea that, that, that in, a, in, a, in a democratic debate, like normally you would expect that people are seeking the truth. And you have to be a bit skeptical too, right? Yeah. I'm largely on your side, but let's face it, when you say truth mm. is a defense, you have to prove it in court, right? Yeah. So there's a big difference in life between something being true and you being able to walk into court and prove it as every lawyer in the room knows. So often truth is not a defense. Mm -hmm. It's true. You have to prove it. And sometimes in defamation you can't prove it. Yeah. But, 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 but you start, we start, uh, uh, James, just, just one point, just one point, just one point. You start with the assumption of your innocence. So one thing that's important about this legislation, uh, James. No, he's talking defamation. Yeah, and defamation, yeah. But, but the honest, I'm the one being sued, I have to prove truth. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, but the, the point with this kind of thing is that if you, if you, have, if, yeah, but you have, you're being accused here. And of, of, for instance, um, doing uh, offending people, and then you start guilty. You cannot. You have to prove your innocence. Then the honors of the proof has been inverted. I know, then, the preaching of the converted. Here. Yeah. So it's a. <laughs> it, well, it's my favorite kind of preaching too. But still. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah. Okay. Let me stop here. Yeah. We have a question over here. We need to break shortly. Um, Michelle, a question to Mr. Prince of I think it demonstrates the complexities of the concept. You know, as I think every speaker's alluded to, everyone in this room would say at the, at the abstract level, we all believe in freedom of speech. It's a great thing, we should protect it. It's a wonderful individual human right. But all rights um, need to be weighed up against other rights. And so in freedom of speech, um, national security concerns are one factor that comes into play, but privacy considerations are another. And the issue that you've raised, um, concerns me on two aspects. Number one, I'm concerned about governments overreaching and having access to that type of information in the first place. But secondly, I'm terrified that somebody might come in and steal that information and put it up on something like WikiLeaks, because as benign as my personal conversations might be, um, I don't want my husband to be able to read on WikiLeaks the fact that I disclosed to my sister the real price of the dress I bought last week. Because as much as that might not have national security implications, it has very important marital ones. So um, You haven't trained them very well. well. You know, I mean, a lot of the times, you know, the information that we're talking about can be very, very benign, but the fact is, it's my decision whether the conversation's private or released in public. It shouldn't be anybody else's. Well, no, so I think there are some real issues but, in relation to the internet and how that But operates. we were facing the same problem during now, at, the, at this present moment, uh, during the American presidential elections. Because I was in America now, they have an ad by the Democratic Party basically recording a private conversation of one of the candidates, Mitt Romney. And I, fi I find it quite uh, uh, disturbing, actually, because... He's not really a private candidate at a fundraising... Yeah, but, but he was not yeah, supposed to be, uh, to be recorded, so he was having a chat with his supporters. And I, I contend that actually, <laughs> what he says is not so 
serious in my opinion, but could, but could be. But I have probably said much worse things in privacy than what he said. So I think this is actually very dangerous when you have actually a person who is uh, in this fundraising. It doesn't really matter, but he's not expected to be recorded. And then at this thing, this is placed on an ad uh, to show how evil he is. I think this is actually uh, unethical, I believe. It's unethical. And, and it, 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 uh, what disturbs me is that some people don't see this as a problem, like to be recording conversations of people and then displaying this on television, when I think it's a quite problematic thing. Yeah. I, I just have a quick skeptical word to John here. But I work in an Australian university. Anybody who thinks that a bureaucracy is going to be a super sort of alt uber conspiracy that's going to monitor every word that anyone ever speaks has never worked in an Australian university where the bureaucracy is so unbelievably incompetent <laughs> they can't do anything right. <laughs> so the idea that there's going to be this world government super body that's going to know is just beyond belief. You know, the Americans, they didn't even predict the, cold, the, the wall coming down. You know, the sea, there's no chance at all of this super conspiracy, you know, knowing every word everyone says. They, they, they can't even, you know, it takes them 10 years to find a guy living in a cave. I'm, I'm very skeptical. <laughs> now, very on that skeptical. note, um, believe it or not, we have been having this discussion for nearly half an hour. So it does seem like it's five minutes. Um, so I'm not robbing you of time. But we do need to have a break um, and have a cup of tea and coffee to revive and replenish.